Welcome to the NWAETC Project ECHO. I'm Kent Unruh, and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Brian Wood, our medical director, for the talk today. Great. Thanks, Kent. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Croy was last week. There was a ton of info. So today we're going to start a three-part series with four different speakers reviewing data from Croy. I'm going to do the first part, which will be hot topics in HIV primary care. Just so you know, this is going to be our plan for the Croy reviews. So primary care today. Next week, we're going to do two didactic talks, so we'll have less cases. Sharisha is going to talk about new antiretroviral treatments. Uh, Ruan Barnabas is going to talk about prep and prevention issues. And then on the, on the 19th, Nina Kim is going to present on some exciting co-infection data. So that's going to be our plan for CROI reviews. So without further ado, I just picked out a couple of what I thought were hot topics in HIV primary care. So in the next 15 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about cancer risk, comparing HIV positive to HIV negative, and specifically risks of lung cancer, and what I thought was a provocative study on whether or not we should be routinely screening for lung cancer, and if so, when in patients with HIV and risk factors, and then I'll move to some benefits of statins beyond cholesterol reduction. So first, there was a whole session on cancers in young and old and lung cancer and HIV. This was the title of the session. It started with a talk from a doc in South Africa talking about cancers in young individuals with HIV. And there was an interesting discussion and a pediatrician from London talked about how they're even seeing cancers in individuals in their 20s the individuals who have been perinatally infected, and by the time they're 20, they've had HIV for 20 years. So I thought there was some really interesting stuff there. I'm not gonna present that data because I know not many on our network do pediatrics, but the abstract is available. I'm gonna start with this, which is a, a Medicare registry study which looks at the risks of various cancers in HIV positive individuals who are over 65 years old. So here they did a case cohort study looking at a 5% random Medicare registry sample, and then they matched that with a large cancer registry database so they basically found all of the cancers in this sample. These were all individuals over age 65, and they compared the risk of various cancers in individuals who either have HIV or do not have HIV, adjusted for age, race, sex, and calendar year. And I think this is a good intro into talking about cancer and HIV, because you can see here the hazard ratios or the increased risk comparing HIV positive to HIV negative individuals. Not surprisingly, we see a very much increased risk of Kaposi's sarcoma in HIV positive individuals, very much increased risk in those in, uh, in certain types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and in anal cancer, I think those things are not surprising. We even see increased risk in Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver cancer, and even lung cancer, and we're gonna talk more about that. And then colorectal and breast cancer, there really was no difference between HIV positive and negative. So these are cancers in which it doesn't necessarily seem like HIV positive individuals, individuals are at any higher risk than those who are HIV negative. And then interestingly, as many studies have shown, there actually seems to be lower risk of prostate cancer in folks with HIV. There was an interesting sort of side discussion about why that might be, whether it's related to hypogonadism, whether it's truly uh, lesser risk, or whether maybe we're just not testing as much. I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that's interesting. Here is the most frequent cancers they saw in this study. So again, these are HIV positive individuals over 65. Uh, and I think what's notable here is that the two most common cancers are lung and prostate cancers, so not necessarily the cancers for which HIV is the biggest risk. It seems here that aging and other risk factors are probably even more important when we get up into this range. But the other notable thing is if you look at any the rates of any cancer, just within five years, 10% of individuals with HIV and age over 65 developed some cancer uh, within five years. So very high rates of cancer in this group. And then I'd like to pull out lung cancer, because this session really went into some specifics about that, and this hit home for me a little bit. Uh, the two most recent deaths I've seen on my panel of HIV positive people were both young individuals with lung cancer. Um, so I think this is really a pertinent issue. So what I'll look at next is one, a study of how much HIV related risk factors like CD4 count play into lung cancer risk and lung cancer survival. Then we'll look at a study that compares 
CD4 count and HIV related factors to smoking and we'll look at which one seems to play a bigger role in the risk and then we'll look at some data for lung cancer screening. So this was a large study from uh, the VAX cohort which is a VA cohort of HIV positive individuals. This study looked at over 26,000 HIV positive persons. They compared that to the VA cancer registry and looked for pathologically confirmed incident non-small cell lung cancer and they fit Cox regression models to compare the lung cancer risk at various CD4 counts adjusted for these other factors like age, sex, race, smoking, history of bacterial pneumonias. There is some data that recurrent bacterial pneumonias in HIV may increase the risk of lung cancer or history of COPD. And they also did some analyses to look at survival differences based on HIV status or CD4 count above or below 200. And really the message here is that the lower the CD4 count, the higher the risk of lung cancer. And you can see the hazard ratios here based on CD4 count below 200, 200 to 500, or they, they compared this to a reference of above 500. And they looked at 12-month lagged values of CD4 count, 12-month moving averages over time, and 24-month moving averages. And basically all of these uh, CD4 counts in the lower ranges were associated with an increased risk of lung cancer. So the, the higher the degree of immunosuppression at any point during someone's HIV course does seem to increase their risk of lung cancer, although CD4 count and HIV status was not associated with lung cancer survival, which I also thought was an important point. So these patients, especially who have ever had advanced immune deficiency, seem to be at higher risk of lung cancer. It does not seem to affect their uh, survival or prognosis once their lung cancer is diagnosed. So then this I thought was a, a very interesting presentation on whether cigarette smoking or or HIV related risk factors plays into a person's risk of lung cancer more. So this was a very large cohort study from the NA Accord cohort. They looked at all non-AIDS defining cancers and they compared various HIV related risk factors like CD4 count, viral load, clinical AIDS diagnosis, also hep C and hep B. And they looked at uh, around 40,000 adults. They had around 160,000 person years. And first, just of note, again, lung cancer was by far the most common non-AIDS defining cancer they found. They saw very high rates of anal cancer, um, followed by uh, prostate, Hodgkin's lymphoma, liver cancer, and breast cancer. And you can see here, this is what's called the population attributable risk. So this, or PAF. So what this means, what these percentages here, these are basically the number of non-AIDS defining cancers that could be avoided if we could take individuals in this category and switch them over to the reference category. So first looking at individuals who ever smoked for all non-AIDS defining cancers, over 35% of those cancers we estimate could be avoided if we could take those people and flip them from the ever smoked to the never smoked category. They also looked here at the green bar, they took out lung cancer and looked at non-AIDS defining cancers excluding cancers of the lung and even those non-lung cancers, almost 30% could be avoided if we could prevent smoking and switch these individuals from the ever smoke to the never smoke category. So I was really impressed by that. So they made a really strong argument that we need to be focusing on smoking prevention. A limitation here is they really only compared ever smoked to never smoked. They weren't able to look at years having quit or factors like that. And the other point here is that cigarette smoking appears to be a much stronger factor for all of these non-AIDS defining cancers as compared to CD4 count, viral load, and other AIDS or HIV related risk factors. So it seems to be here that individuals with HIV are at much higher risk for a lot of non-AIDS defining cancers, including lung cancer, Smoking we know is a huge risk and seems to be a more important risk factor than their HIV related criteria. Although as we showed, a lower CD4 count at any point during HIV treatment does increase risk for lung cancer. I'll just remind everybody about the US Preventive Service Task Force recs in the general population for lung cancer screening, which is that we do yearly low dose CT for all asymptomatic adults age 55 to 80 who have a 30 pack year smoking history or uh, have quit within the past 15 years. So now I think we have the first presentation here on this lung cancer screening in HIV positive individuals. And I think there's some really interesting stuff here. So this was a French study, it was at 14 centers. They offered single low dose chest CT to all who enrolled in this study. Their inclusion criteria were age above 40, 
ever smoked within the last three years, greater than 20 pack years of smoking. They included a CD4 nadir less than 350, as we talked about in that prior abstract, that is a risk factor for lung cancer, and current CD4 above 100. They had 442 subjects with a mean age of about 50, a mean nadir CD4 of 168, and a mean last CD4 of 574, most of whom were virologically suppressed. So these are individuals who had a history of advanced disease, but mostly currently well controlled, and a median pa smoking pack years of 30. 94 subjects had a significant finding on the chest CT and they had some definitions for what meant a significant finding based on lug nodule, appearance and size, adenopathy, and other factors. They ended up with 18 diagnostic procedures and 15 subjects. Here are the results and I'll just point out a couple things. So 10, they identified 10 instances of cancer Nine of those were detected on screening. One case of uh, extensive small cell cancer was not picked up on the screening, but nine out of 10 were picked up on screening. Most of them were adenocarcinomas. They made the point that six out of the 10 were caught at early stage, although you'll notice the four that were not uh, were a late stage, stage four. And then I think the most interesting thing here is that if you look at the age, Eight out of 10 of these were in individuals aged under 55. So these are folks who would not have been caught by low dose CT following the U uh, US Preventive Service Task Force guidelines for the general population. So they made the argument here that maybe in HIV, we need different criteria. Maybe we need to be starting earlier, especially in those with low nadir CD4 counts. So they made the point that lung cancer screening with low dose CT and HIV is safe and effective. Current guidelines for the general population may miss early cancers in young individuals, but we have these question marks. When should we start in HIV? Which criteria should we be using? Should we be going by age, number of pack years, CD4 nadir? So I think we need more information, um, but I think this, this really is food for thought. They did make the point that there were no cancers aged between 40 and 45, but maybe we should be starting in HIV at 45 in individuals who have a history of advanced disease or a high number of smoking pack years. Be curious everyone's thoughts about that uh, when we finish the talk. I'll transition then to some interesting data on benefits of statins beyond cholesterol reduction. Just by means of um, segueing from cancer to statins, there are a couple of recent papers. We talked about this one in our Madison Clinic Journal Club showing that statins may decrease uh, cancer risk in HIV. This paper from CID showed a 57% reduction in non-AIDS defining cancers in HIV positive individuals taking statins. Uh, this one from AIDS from 2014 showed a 55% reduction in cancer in individuals taking statins, primarily AIDS defining cancers in that study. So interesting data for statins. This presentation at CROI, I, I really thought there was a lot of, of meat here. So this is a study from the group at MGH, Janet Lowe and Steve Grinspoon, who have done some really pivotal work on metabolic issues in HIV. So they did a double blind, placebo controlled, single center, randomized control trial, where they recruited individuals and randomized them to either a torvastatin or placebo. They got 20 milligrams of, a tor of torvastatin for the first three months, and then if they were tolerating it, up to 40 milligrams. They ended up with 40 subjects, all of whom had no known coronary artery disease, LDLs between 70 and, and 130, the mean LDL was 125. They did CT angiography and all of these individuals had subclinical coronary plaques or subclinical atherosclerosis. One, one important thing here is that in order to get 40 subjects with these criteria, they only had to screen 81. So half of the individuals they screened who were HIV positive, who would not qualify for statins, at least by the old Framingham guidelines, had subclinical atherosclerosis. So I think that in and of itself is impressive. All were stable on ART, and then at 12 months, they repeated the CT angiography. And the atorvastatin group had a significantly better change in their non-calcified coronary plaque volume. They had an improvement of 19.4% compared to, and I think this is impressive too, the group who got placebo had a mean 20.4% increase in non-calcified plaque over just a year. And again, these are all individuals with subclinical atherosclerosis. But I, this change, I think, is, is very scary. 
And these non-calcified coronary plaques, uh, this group and others have shown, these are very vulnerable, high-risk plaques for rupture. They also showed in the atorvastatin group a significantly different change in, in addition to overall plaque volume, the number of high-risk plaques, so these would be plaques with low attenuation or positive remodeling, which also show uh, that these are vulnerable, high-risk plaques. So I thought, th I thought this was very staggering. 80% who got placebo had progression of their plaques and they offered these images as an example uh, versus only 35 progressed and excuse me, 65% had some regression with atorvastatin and they offered these images as an example of a patient with reg regression of plaques. So very high rates of subclinical atherosclerosis in this group and some benefits from statins as compared to placebo in just a year. Just in the next two minutes or so, some other data, I was really just amazed at how many presentations there were at Croy about benefits of statins. So I'm not gonna go into these in detail, and this is not all of them, but there was some data from the Saturn HIV trial that rosuvastatin, just 10 milligrams compared to placebo, stops progression of carotid intima media thickness. There was some lab data showing that simvastatin protects uh, human aortic endothelial cells from oxidative damage, and that atorvastatin basically improves levels of this cytoprotective enzyme that they postulated could have a protective effect effect with HIV-associated neurocognitive disorder, and they suggested more studies in hand of ART plus statins. This was really just a poster, and I thought this was really interesting about statins improving sustained virologic response and reducing fib fibrosis progression and HCC among those persons with hep C. I didn't go into detail about this because they actually excluded HIV in this study, but this agrees with some other data like from HALT-C that maybe individuals with hep C have better outcomes in terms of uh, both liver and hep C treatment if they're on a statin. I think we need more data about whether we should be doing that routinely. And then there was this negative trial, w which also was from Saturn HIV, and this group had previously published 48-week data showing a benefit of statins for bone mineral density, but then the 96-week data was no different than placebo, and actually they highlighted that the statin group had a detrimental effect on insulin resistance, so had um, more individuals with a blood glucose over 100 and higher insulin levels, and they had sort of a model of insulin resistance and had higher insulin resistance in that group. So lots of benefits from statins, some uh, small cause for concern here about worsening insulin resistance, but I think given all that, it's not surprising that we're seeing articles ti with titles like this, Should Everyone Aging with HIV Take a Statin? This is from the new Lancet HIV Journal just from last month, and this accompanied the study from Janet Lowe about reducing coronary plaques, and I think that Amy Justice and her colleagues here give a, a very level-headed sort of opinion that, well, there's lots of benefits, but we also need to consider other things. They mention hepatotoxicity, polypharmacy. I added here myopathy. You know, some individuals just don't tolerate statins, drug interactions, costs. So lots to consider. We've talked about how HIV infection raises the risk of many non aids defining malignancies. It seems like smoking outweighs the risk but I think we need good guidelines for screening of lung cancer uh, and other malignancies in HIV. Statins obviously have many potential benefits, but we have to weigh that against some risks. And then this trial, I think we're gonna get good data from. Reprieve is trying to recruit 6,500 individuals with HIV and is randomizing them to a statin or placebo, and they have one of the most impressive websites I've ever seen from a clinical trial. It's worth taking a look at. But I'll stop there. We'll take a couple minutes for questions and comments, and then we'll go to cases.